stress too much, it has an argument of you. That's it. Um, how do we approach a common threat? Oh, by the way, I'm an indigenous psychologist. This is from the perspective of indigenous psychology. How do we approach a common To be an indigenous psychology is not to deny there is something in common that all we all human beings share in common. The question, what is it exactly? How do you spell that out? And when you spell that commonality in simplistic terms, you can carry an element of evil. Evil in the sense of oppression. Especially when you impose the Western ideas as science, as what is the standard of the common, what is common about human nature, and the impose it on everybody else. And that is an element of evil because it carries the seeds of oppression. So, how do we approach this question of what is common? Um, from an indigenous psychologist's point of view, there is something that is in common, but we have to approach it in a more sophisticated way. For instance, we can talk about commonality in terms of structure. Structure. You can talk about the structure of meaning, yes. That, uh, that we uh, get in trouble when we, uh, we are guilty of oppression or imposing our own beliefs when we talk about the content of what <coughs> we have in content of meaning. My meaning is the meaning. And what we decide, what we know to be true, to be good, to be evil, is the good or the evil. When you talk about the content of meaning, we get in trouble. We can talk about the structure of meaning, how human beings, what is the structure of, of the meaning system? That we can, as scholars, we can study and we can compare and we can um, research. But if, we, if our research is based on the content of what we know to be, uh, what is meaningful, because this is what made the West meaning, it's meaningful in the West. And that is scientifically, uh, empirically supported. That does not mean that it's universally meaningful. It does not mean it's universally meaningful to other cultures. Uh, that is something we have to be careful. Those terms are empty. Freedom. Um, you 
No freedom that's not like The freedom from being the West. Democracy. Your freedom is not necessarily the kind of freedom uh, in China. A democracy. Even when Chinese have democracy, they have their own way. Uh, we are now having a um, the Chinese indigenous psychology is discovering other forms of, uh, of leadership, for instance. Um, we are discovering other forms of how to degrade. Uh, the assumption is those characteristic countries, uh, cultures, they can't be created because you have to listen to the boss. How can you be created? You don't have individualism. You cannot think on your own. How can you be great? If the China, if China is not great, China is, is not cannot be so successful as it is now. How do we explain that, that the Chinese economy is far ahead of the West? And they are not great. And they are all just followers. It's not possible. And by history, China has been not been created. That's not true either. Okay, so the question is not to go by what we know, what the West knows about creativity, but to have an open mind. Go to China and find out from the, cult, the local culture what is creativity in their own experience. How the creativity game is played in their experience their way, instead of talking about our own terms of what is creativity, what is freedom, those are all empty words. And China does have their own way of creativity at the one who is your time. <laughs> that you're talking about those values, um, weren't we discussing what makes life worth living? Maybe not to be for the makes life worth living for some people. Why do we assume necessarily that you know, those are the values? I, I'd like to hear from you actually at the end there, because we haven't heard from you yet, and I feel uncomfortable about that. I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Family, if at all, 
uh, and um, even I could have said goodbye, a decent goodbye uh, to those dear people. Well, I have no answer. Perhaps that's my motivation to study Holocaust survivors. Perhaps I think that some clue is hidden in their wisdom. Uh, but uh, I've been developing my conceptual model, uh, which I call the pursuit of happiness in a hostile world. Uh, the conception of the hostile world scenario, a conception that I'm developing, uh, is not really about random adversity uh, uh, that we uh, all cope with. Natural disasters, accidents, illnesses, bereavement. Uh, it's also and mainly about uh, adversity produced by evil, human evil. War, terrorism, violence, crime, oppression, abuse. Well, lessons from uh, social psychology, the famous studies of on obedience, on the prison mentality, and all these problems showed us that evil is not only there, it's not only outside, it's within us. It's us. You actually said it. And uh, uh, we, can, we are potential perpetrators. Well, now I turn into the issue of happiness. That's the other side of the equation. Well, uh, I'm looking for happiness in both ways, in both uh, senses, the hedonic uh, happiness, which means pleasant drive, and the the morning uh, happiness, which means meaningful life. Well, uh, it is still amazing uh, that the 1776 Declaration of Independence of the United States aligned together the pursuit of happiness with life and liberty as unalienable rights. So, I know that so many historians and philosophers work hard just to know what Thomas Jefferson really meant in the wording of the pursuit of happiness. Um, uh, but I take the word pursuit is more essential even than the word happiness. Pursuit means that there is no right of happiness. There is a right to pursue happiness. And that comes uh, to my essential belief that happiness also meaning, meaning included, I mean also meaning it's not about the it's not about the outcome. I'm not, I don't I don't look uh, for the outcome of meaning and happiness. It's about the process. It's about the way to. And meaning as well as happiness is a working system, if you like, a search system. Uh, uh, with which uh, we pursue in order to gain a favorable psychological environment uh, which would be functional for us uh, in our daily life um, and uh, uh, which will uh, let us flourish with the good virtues of humankind. So, the question <laughs> asked here, what makes life worth living? So difficult to try, so difficult that I would just modestly say that I'm, a, 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 I'm a cherish the dialectics of life, the opposites of good and bad, of evil and good. Because dialectics means options, means complexity, means an outlet for creativity. 
dialectics means that we have to contain opposites and live with that and, um, and uh, given, perhaps that's the reason why life is worth living, we can give, even impose our own meaning, subjective meaning, our own meaning uh, on, uh, uh, on life and on ourselves and on the world, which may otherwise be meaningless. So that's our contribution. Thank you. So just following in Emmy's lead, I want to make sure that all of our experts get involved here and contribute to the conversation. Thank you. I was glad to hear the word you name on the introduced at the, yeah, at the table. Uh, there's another term that has not been used and that I'd like to uh, uh, offer to you, and that is the term self-realization, which is closely allied to the concepts of, uh, of eudaimonia. And when somebody uses a term like self-realization, the uh, first thoughts that come to mind are egoism, that the person is acting on their own behalf, what is in their best interests, and uh, uh, with a relative insensitivity to uh, what uh, others may uh, think, believe, need in any given situation. And as an empirical psychologist, as well as someone interested in philosophy and personality theories, when I get a review of the literature and in my own research, one of the things that constantly emerges is that the people who are highest on measures of self-realization are the ones who have the most to offer to other people and who, in practice, actually do the most to benefit others, whether in their close relationships, and their love relationships, or in uh, uh, their uh, service to the uh, uh, community. So that individualism and interdependence are not antithetical. Quite the contrary, they are actually mutually supportive um, uh, concepts. And um, I think if, uh, to, to focus on something that I'm not going to include in, in my uh, talk, as I otherwise feel uh, be uh, giving them just the takeaway messages, uh, uh, if, uh, as a, uh, a non-believer, I can quote uh, the Rabbi Hillel in uh, his uh, Talmudic uh, writings, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am for myself alone, what am I? If not now, when? Now those first two lines are fairly easily understood. If I am not for myself, means I, I really need to stand up and be able to express in any relationship, in any context, where I'm coming from and how I perceive it and what my interests are. Otherwise, I'm going to get right on. If I am for myself alone, what am I? If I'm insensitive to the needs of the other people around me, then yes, that's egoism. And I rather suspect other people aren't going to want to have a whole lot to do with me, and appropriately so. But then we get to that third line, if not now, when? And that's actually what I see as the key line in that phrase, because it suggests the need to balance expressions of one's own interests with responsiveness to the interests of the people with whom we interact. The concept we now call mutuality, and it is the people who have the most sense of who they are, of what their own potentials are, of their ability to express those potentials, who are the ones who are the least needy in relationships who are the most able to use their talents and their skills for, their, for the people with whom they interact with, whether at the level of, in, uh, of, of close personal relationships or at the level of the communities in which they, um, um, in which they live. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop at that point and, and uh, 
you know, emphasize the uh, self-realization is different for every person. So we're not imposing any particular meaning or value on, on others, but each person needs to uh, find what they own, what they need for self-expression. Actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'll take that back. I'm not going to stop. I guess it's not the other topic on this table has been the nature of evil. And I use the word potential. And I think that one of the things that is recognized throughout here is that we have potentials to act in positive, pro-social ways. And we have the potential to act in ways that are destructive to those uh, around us. And so the concept of self-realization could mean that it is the realization of our potentials for evil, just as, I, as it could mean our potentials for mutuality. So we need to bring in some other moral standard that allows us to distinguish between those potentials that are for the benefit of ourselves and the benefit of the people around us and those that operate in ways that are destructive of other people. For me, that's Kant's categorical imperative. It is John Rawls, Rawls' decision making behind a uh, veil of uh, ignorance. Uh, it's uh, Jürgen Habermas's um, uh, communication Communicative action, thank you. Um, uh, there are lots of standards that are out there that will allow us to distinguish between those uh, forms of potentials that can be eudaimonic from those that would be maldaimonic. At that point, I will stop. Question about the Pillow's statement, which I, I think I preferred and I thought it was really simple to understand, particularly the third part, which is, can you say that again? If, if not now, then. And if, I just heard that as um, starting today. You can't be a good person tomorrow, you have to be a good person today. That's okay. quite helpful. The, um, um, there, uh, my, my training is in clinical psychology, and um, Although I've been an academic psychologist throughout, throughout my career. But people would have to come and find me out with what I would refer to as pre-divorce counseling. And uh, one of the term, one of the statements that I would hear over and over and over again is, I have given and given and given in this relationship. When is it my turn? And uh, what was ironic in this is that both sides in the marriage, we're making exactly the same statement to me. So they have something in common. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. What was happening was that they were giving the wrong things. They were giving the things that, that they wanted to give rather than what the partner needed in, uh, in that uh, relationship. And so the question of if not now, when, is one of mutuality. It is one of it's fine for me to give more in the relationship at this point in time because my partner needs certain things from me at this point in time. But when is it my turn? That I have a legitimate concern with at some point in time having my needs become the focus of concern within the relationship. Uh, I, don't, I guess we haven't been talking about sexuality here yet, but perhaps we should. Mutual orgasms are great, but they're not the only satisfying form of sexuality. Turn taking is perfectly good too. <laughs> but, you know, well, for both partners to be able to say, when is it my turn, and not just say something. I think you now know what makes life worth